Welcome, everybody. We're going to go ahead and kick off now. A couple minutes late. Sorry about that. I'm Steve Higdon with the Big Bourbon Club. Great to have all of you here. Welcome to Kentucky Peerless Distilling. And the gentlemen, the, um, it's not Charlie's Angels by any means, but it's a great threesome of whiskey right up here. It's Corky's Angels. It's Corky's Angels. Welcome. We're glad to have you here. Let me ask you a question. Raise your hand if you've traveled from out of town to come here tonight. Raise them high. So you've got more than half of the group. Wow. So who traveled the furthest? I know we've got some Texas in the house, Michigan in the house, Arkansas, Alabama. Bulgaria. Bulgaria. <laughs> Thank you for coming to Louisville and to coming to Kentucky, and thanks for all the locals that came out as well. We're glad to have you here. So let me remind you. So first of all, the Big Bourbon Club, most of you know, but this is only our second event, right? We're doing one event a month right here at Joe's. And we're doing live presentations and tastings here at Joe's. Um, and we're going to, you have to go to BigBourbonClub.com and go to the event page. And the schedule is up to date there. You can follow us on BigBourbonClub.com and, of course, on the app, BigBourbon.Club. You can find the events on there as well. So we appreciate you coming out and planning your, your, your day and your weekends around us. We're very excited to have you. So the Big Bourbon Club. Uh, hey, Cress, don't go anywhere yet. Come here a second. So you all know Cress Bride, my partner. Cress and I started the Big Bourbon Club. Cress, Cress is the owner and our host. He owns Joe's Older Than Dirt. He's owned it for 42 years now. He started it when he was 12 years old. What a great place to have a bourbon club meeting, right? Perfect place, the best neighborhood whiskey bar in Louisville, Kentucky. So, Crest, thank you very much. Absolutely. Thanks to all of you big bourbon club members. We now have, does anybody know how many members we have now, Lance? Do you know? 2,700. We've been practicing all night. We've got 2,700 members in four months. And remember, we have three categories of members. The first membership level my bride, Suzanne, called, named it, yeah, you, the Rick House. So the Rick House is the free membership, forever free. Anybody can join up for free, and it will always be free. But with that free membership, you get access to the app. I'm doing my best. I'm just, I've got ADHD, and my head is bouncing around like crazy now. The Rick House is the free membership. Encourage your friends, encourage your family, sign up for free, get on the app, join the Big Bourbon family and have fun with it. The second level is the small batch. Small batch is $75 a year. So for the price that this table pays for a bottle of whiskey, it's about half price because all these people are rich. But for 75 bucks a year, Tom Reed, you can be a small batch member and with that, you get a lot of different perks. You can see it on the website. And, of course, the top shelf member is $125 a year. Top shelf is where you have full access, full access to all of the events for the price of $125. So thank you for those who've invested in the club. Ma'am. Sorry. Um, so anyway, with that, I'm going to turn it over and introduce our guest tonight. Peer Kentucky Peerless Distilling. In the middle is Caleb is the youngest master distiller in the universe, as far as I'm concerned. This is not a commercial. Caleb Kilburn is 29 years old. I think he is the officially the youngest master distiller of any distillery. Caleb, thank you for coming out. Caleb, my belt is older than you. Cordell Lawrence. Cordell has been on our board for the Big Bourbon Club from the very beginning. He's been a great friend, a great supporter. 
Cordell is really the reason why we had the opportunity to get the double oak barrel pick, which is truly a unicorn and a very rare opportunity for our club and for any club for that matter. So, Cordell, thank you for making that happen. My pleasure. Thanks for having us. And it was actually on this patio we first started talking about this idea, Steve. We did. We sat down here and we brainstormed and we've come a long way since then. So thanks for all your leadership and help thank with you. that. We appreciate it. And thanks for all those after evening calls that you would take of mine. <laughs> John Waydell. John is single, first of all. I just want everybody to know that. <laughs> John, you're single, right? I am. Okay, he is. He admitted it. John is single. He left out the barrel curator, single barrel curator. Well, I was getting ready to say that. Well, I probably would have forgot it. John is actually the single barrel curator at Peerless Distilling, and John's been a big supporter since day one as well. So, the three gentlemen of Peerless are going to take over, and they're going to walk you through different aspects of Kentucky Peerless Distilling, tell you a quirky story, the history, the brands. We're going to have a great tasting coming up. And so with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Caleb. Thank you. Well, good deal. I think... Uh, Good deal. So we don't want this to be something where we're going to wait until the end to taste all the product because that'd be really hard to Come stay focused now. that long. We want to taste. We're here to drink, right? So we're going to start with our small batch rye whiskey. Uh, they're going to be in the process of pouring that out. We ask that you hold off until we can speak about it, uh, but we're going to pause until we actually get that poured for you all. Uh, so to start the process, we're actually going to talk about the family's history, and that's where John's actually going to take over for a little bit. Yeah, first of all, I just want to say thank everyone for uh, coming here tonight. Some of y'all had a little bit longer journey than the others, but it's greatly appreciated. You know, we're a small distillery right in the heart of downtown Louisville off 10th and Main. Um, if anybody's around town tomorrow, please come down and see us. But, you know, our story and journey starts back with Corky's great-grandfather. So we're owned by the fourth and fifth generation, um, Corky and Carson Taylor. Uh, Corky's great-grandfather, Henry Craver, started this back in 1889 in Henderson, Kentucky. He bought a small distillery from a friend of his called Mr. Warsham. The Warsham Distillery changed the name to Peerless. But, you know, he put a lot of money into that. At the time he was doing over there, only doing about 10 to 12 barrels a day. Um, in about two years' time, he had them producing over 200 barrels a week. Now, you got to think, that was a lot of product to move back then. You know, you were shoving coal into your still to run back then. But he purchased a lot of land, was developing a lot of property there in Henderson. And, you know, of course, Prohibition came along, which kind of shut us down. Um, so it was 100 years later that his great-grandson decided to reopen the distillery right in downtown Louisville. We bought an old tobacco warehouse. Um, and now Caleb, our master distiller, you know, what a lot of people don't realize is that he helped lay, lay the foundation, too, there at Kentucky Peerless, putting in the piping, laying the still out and everything for him, too. But, you know, Corky's uh, history runs so deep in the industry. If you notice on your bottles, if you have them, our DSP number, DSP number reads 50 on those bottles. Um, for those that are familiar with that, that is your distilled spirits product or plant number that you have that's issued to you when you start up your distillery. Now, if we wouldn't have got that number back, our DSP number would have been around the 20,000s to kind of give you an idea of how many are actually out there in the industry. So that was a big deal for us to have that DSP number 50 back. You know, Henry Craver, um, he was a shaker and mover of his time. You know, he was a banker by trade, sat on the board of over six different banks. He had a young daughter, Helena Craver. Um, who actually pretty much ran the distillery, her and her husband, um, Roy Taylor Sr. So that's where the Craver name will drop off. We'll have the Taylor name pick up. You know, they ran the brewery, ran the distillery, took care of the day-to-day -day operations back then. And then they had one son, Roy Taylor Jr. That was Corky's father. Uh, that's really the only generation that kind of skips the distillery. Uh, he was sent off to boarding school at the age of five, um, where he stayed till he was five, till he was 19 years old at uh, boarding school. Now, the reason he wasn't a part of the distillery is he actually went into the service, as you can imagine, where he was over there fighting wars. Um, he was in World War II, he was in Korea, Vietnam, and he was out there on the battleship during the Bay of Pigs. So Corky had a pretty good childhood. He grew up surfing the beaches of Hawaii and playing golf till he was about 15 years old um, until his dad decided it was time for them to retire um, and they were going to go back to Henderson. But Corky wasn't fortunate enough to go back there. He ended up in boarding school himself where he spent about three years at Castle Heights Military Academy um, until he was kindly asked to leave by the staff there. Uh, but he puts a lot of blame on that on his roommates, which if you've been down there at the distillery, you know, uh, his two roommates were the Almond Brothers, uh, where Corky got in a lot of trouble with them at the, distiller, or at the uh, boarding school, if you can imagine. Where uh, eventually, you know, from there, 
uh, Corky, you know, grew up, went back to Henderson, grew up there, played sports, uh, went to play golf. I mean, he's been in all kinds of things. But now him and his youngest son, Carson, run the distillery. We're family-owned and operated. Um, we have one of the best staff here, too, as well. Um, Caleb, our master distiller, Cordell, our global marketer, um, which a lot of people, you know, we have the easy job of getting the taste and go through everything, whereas Cordell, he pretty much keeps everything running for us and uh, makes stuff like this happen. So, Absolutely. Do we have all of the rye poured now? Almost. Almost. Right, in the meantime, why don't we go ahead and open it up. Any questions about kind of our formation story, our journey along the way, family history? Anything along those lines? Any curiosities? Any relation to E.H. Taylor, Ms. Taylor? Great question. The question was, any relation to E.H. Taylor? We are not. Uh, there is no relation. Good question, though. Thank you. We get that a lot. Uh, we think there is a uh, connection, actually, to 12th President Zachary Taylor. Correct. There is a connection. So if you are familiar with a product known as our Absinthe Finished Rye, that was a collaboration with a local brandy absinthe uh, distillery here in Louisville called Copper and Kings. Um, think along those lines, but in different categories. There's going to be a lot of barrel finishing innovation and things that are kind of unorthodox innovation partnerships down the road that you would not expect. So I'll just leave it at that and stay tuned. Does everybody have a sample of the Peerless Small Batch Rye? Anybody not get one? Are you in the club? All right, so Connor, we've got two in the back here, if you don't mind. Raise your hand so you can see where to come. All right, so I think everybody has one. Perfect. And real quick before we jump into tasting, just some stats about the Small Batch Rye. Uh, so we kind of kidded that, you know, Caleb was searching for job security until this first product came out. Luckily, he's very humble, but I will brag on him. His first release, our small batch rye, was the 15th overall best whiskey in the entire world by Whiskey Advocate Magazine. That was all whiskey categories. Um, he appreciates the applause. Um, so that was Scotch, Canadian whiskey, Japanese, Irish whiskey, you name it. Every single category, number one overall rye whiskey in the world. That was in 2017. Um, so pretty amazing. A lot of people think of rye whiskey as overly harsh, kind of an oak and a pepper spice bomb, you know, not for them. You'll notice that this is more what we call a bourbon drinker's rye. Not overly astringent, very palatable, a lot of layered complexity, and a really enjoyable pour. So without further ado, I'll let him dive into technical details. And again, make this casual, make this comfortable. Feel free to uh, reach out with any tasting notes that you're experiencing, any thoughts you have about Maybe a comparison of some other product you've had that's similar or not similar. I uh, want to make this kind of interactive for everybody, for sure. So, go ahead. Good deal. So, when we're talking about our rye whiskey, we really didn't want to come out with a overly peppery, overly spicy. Uh, it, we didn't want it to be something you had to have hair on your chest to enjoy. We wanted it to be something that was complex, desirable, has a lot of sweet tones, a lot of uh, this herbaceous natures and characteristics to it. So... Uh, we use things like sweet mashing that I'll get into here in a minute and uh, low distillation proof and high barrel entry uh, or high barrel strength. Uh, what ends up happening is we try to make something that's as full and robust a flavor as possible. So what we'll do, uh, y'all are a fairly vocal group. We want to talk back and forth. I don't want to tell you what I'm tasting. I want to hear what you're smelling, what you're tasting, what you're sensing. So everybody, let's take a small whiff of the glass, and I want to hear from some of you all what are some of the notes that you smell our award-winning small batch rye whiskey. Cherries, love it. Got some maple. Good amount of cinnamon. Even a little bit of like pipe tobacco in there, which actually incorporates some of the cherries that were mentioned earlier. Caleb, did you say, if, if, I'm sorry if I missed you, the mash bill, what percent rye? So we don't have the exact number of the uh, mash bill released to the public. Since we're among friends, I'll say it's 
roughly 60 some percent. That's about as precise as I can get. All right, so a question from Facebook is, it's 67 percent rye. Is that considered for a rye whiskey really high, kind of average, low? Uh, I would say it's definitely on the lower end. Uh, most people are familiar with an MGP style rye, which would be a 95.5. So 95% uh, rye is where you get that extremely hot, very peppery, uh, nearly overwhelming amount of rye within the whiskey. Uh, when we were sitting down to make it, we wanted to make something that was a little bit more balanced uh, to focus on some of the notes that we love within a bourbon, just within a rye. Uh, so through many of our practices, we're able to harvest a ton of flavor and that comes through really well in our rye whiskey. That's why, as Cordell said, it is a bourbon drinker's rye. No problem. So let's go ahead and move on. Let's take a very small taste on the front of our palate and let it slowly fade back across. And again, I want to hear from the audience what you all are tasting. Any thoughts? Anybody? Steve? You're always good at tasting notes. Preferably uh, involving Greek gods. <laughs> well, let's let the big bourbon club members speak up first. Very nice. It's peppery but smooth. Peppery but smooth. I like it. Did you understand that accent from Michigan? It was a little bit strong. It sounded almost close to Wisconsin a little bit. But definitely, I, I love the way you describe it because it is still rooted in the fact it is a rye whiskey, but it's prominent with rye, not overwhelming. It's not something that's going to be so peppery, so hot, so spicy that it's not enjoyable. Any other thoughts? Any other tasty notes? What kind of tea? Black tea. Black tea, I like black it. Black tea? A lot of times we'll have like an Earl Grey tea or black tea in there. That's a great description. What about the Callahans? Did you all get anything off that? A little harsh? That's the rye. Maybe a little melon. Melon? Melon, I like it. Kind of that crisp uh, but sweet uh, characteristic. Another way I've typically described that is like a nectar type of uh, quality, where it's very floral. I, I grew up with a lot of honeysuckle around me, so that's what I always relate it to. Amy? On my second taste, I get citrus. I love citrus. It's, it's probably my favorite tasting note of, between our bourbon and our rye because it just anchors it so well. Uh, we've actually had John craft a ton of really good old fashions that taste as if they've already had that orange wedge in there. How many of you have purchased a bottle of Peerless Rye before? How many have this on your bourbon shelf? Wow, we appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you all. So, are we ready to progress? Yes, sir. Let's do it. At your so, pace, yeah. I'll let you go ahead. We're going to work on our small batch bourbon next, so they'll be pouring that. And I'll go ahead and give you a little background as far as how we make our product. So, as John mentioned, Peerless had a very rich, uh, very storied history that really, uh, it, it was built on this reputation of producing a high-quality craft spirit. Uh, they didn't have an antique mash bill. They didn't have some old family recipe to follow, but they did have this standard to build on. And that was quite liberating to me as a distiller. So when I was able to establish what made a Kentucky Pearls product, it wasn't limited to certain mash bill X or to certain uh, processes. We were able to go out and select what we felt were the best practices from cooking all the way through distillation and even into maturation that we felt would make the best whiskey possible. So this process starts with a sweet mash whiskey, which is very unique within, within the industry. 
Uh, most product is made using a sour mash process because that was the way it was done way back when. And most brands have been around since way back when. So what you do with a sour mash is you take a piece of a prior fermentation and use it as the base for the next one. Uh, what this does is it produces a reliable whiskey, but it has this distinct sour mash note to it. It's similar to the grit within a sourdough bread. Uh, when you go to distill this product, you have to be very careful to make sure it doesn't become over concentrated, so you end up having a lot of collateral damage in distilling that out of the product. You leave behind a lot of citrus, a lot of fruit, a lot of uh, this really nice fatty uh, umami characteristic that you get near the tails portion of the cut. Well, we wanted to maximize the flavor within our whiskey, so by going with a sweet mash, which is much more tedious, it takes a lot more time in cleaning, a lot more ingredients, we get to use a first generation yeast and never repeat it. What it does is it produces a very sweet, very floral beer. This very sweet, very floral beer, again, doesn't have this sour mash note, so when we're going to distill it, we get a ton of flavor, a ton of grain, a ton of fruit, a ton of yeast character within our whiskey. Couple this with the fact that we distill at a very low proof, and we end up with a very, very flavorful uh, new make uh, product. Uh, that's on both our bourbon and our rye. So when we take that product, we entrust it to the barrel. We do something that is the norm 150 years ago, but not the norm today. If you look back to when uh, Peerless was originally in operation, the norm was to go into the barrel at a very low proof, below 110, and to serve it at barrel strength or at 100 proof as a bonded whiskey. The reason they did this is because they wanted to have full, robust flavors within their products. Well, uh, that's kind of what we wanted to go back to. If you fast forward to the modern way of doing things, there in the 60s when whiskey was pitted against neutral spirits that were both cheap and easier for cocktail culture, the industry shifted up to a higher barrel entry proof and then diluting their product after maturation. Well, anytime you start with something concentrated and you dilute it, it ends up cutting a lot of the flavor and characteristics, uh, additionally causing you to have to even chill filter that product. But for us, because we want to go back to the original way of doing things where it's full and robust and you actually taste the whiskey, uh, it was a no-brainer for us to go in the barrel that same, the same way it was 150 years ago. That's Steve. I was trying to figure out, like, who's near a microphone? Sorry about that. No worries. You're good. Okay. So when you look back 150 years ago, the way it was made as far as having a full, robust whiskey, that's what we wanted to get back to. So we go in the barrel at a low proof of 107. We mature our whiskey, and at the end of maturation, we don't add a drop of water, we don't chill filter, we don't do anything to adulterate or change that whiskey. All we do is we simply go out, we taste the barrels, which is actually quite novel within the industry, is going out and tasting every single barrel. Myself, John, and other people there at the distillery, we go through and we grade every barrel. If we feel that it is not reach its peak potential, we put it back on the shelf. We let it keep aging, we don't touch it. We don't go into the rick house with a certain quota or a certain objective as far as what we want to go and let that skewer judgment. Instead, we just taste and see, is this ready? Is this a peerless caliber barrel? And if it is, we have to figure out where it fits within our portfolio. When we're assembling batches, much like the raw batch you just tasted and the bourbon batch that you're getting ready to taste, uh, when you're observing that product, we're looking for balance. So what I'm doing is I'm selecting barrels from all different corners of the flavor wheel and assembling them so that the resulting batch is better than any individual barrel that goes into it. I'm finding ones that are great role players, one that can contribute a great nose or contribute a great citrus note or maybe some tea or some tobacco or some of these other notes. Uh, so when we're selecting for batches, we have to find role players. But in that process, occasionally we come across ones that are just too unique and you simply just can't justify mingling this product. It's just too special all on its own. So those are ones that John and I work together on to make sure that we find certain groups, certain liquor stores, people who can actually appreciate the uniqueness of a single barrel. I'm not going to go too far in depth on single barrel selection because I think John's actually going to walk us through the process and I think Steve may have a few things to add in. Uh, but I think, uh, have we poured the bourbon? Is the bourbon passed around? Yes. Good. All right. Everyone has bourbon. Okay. So without further ado, let's jump in on that. I've got to pour myself some first real quick. Oh, we had a question? A couple more. Okay, okay. Well, I'll pour my own. And it, does anybody have any questions about the process of making the whiskey itself? In the back.
just room temp. It, it, it's no, no. It, it comes off the steel through a condenser. I think these are off, so I'll just speak really loud here. Uh, yeah, when it, when it comes off the steel, it runs through a condenser. It gets it down to roughly 50, 60 degrees. Uh, entry temperature into the barrel is not really that important because it's going to spend four, five, six years in that barrel. It shouldn't change it long term. Again, it, it's going to spend five, six years in that barrel. Uh, over the course of that time, a slight head start from a hotter entry or a little bit of uh, a delay, a head, not a head start, giving the other ones a head start, uh, isn't really going to affect it all that much. But on that point, it's interesting to note that Kentucky's climate, as we always kid about, right, you can wait 15 minutes and it's like winter to spring or spring to winter otherwise. Um, the reason is that does a lot in terms of that barrel being a breathing vessel, right? Hot, humid summer, pushing that liquid out into the wood. Winter, it's contracting. So the more you have those cycles and wild variation in temperature and seasons, the better it is for the product. So Kentucky's the ideal climate. The question is where we source our grain and if it's the same people every single time. We work with Consolidated Grain and Barge, which is located seven or eight minutes away from the distillery. Great people, and they buy from the same group of farmers, uh, but it's, I can't say that it's coming off the same farm every single time. That being said, they do specialize in distillery grade grains, which uh, is actually quite a specialty. Uh, we need corn to be a lot cleaner, rye to be a lot cleaner uh, than the typical uh, uses within the marketplace. Uh, so we do specialize uh, by using a specialty granary. Ma'am. Can you hear the question? Over here. Yeah, can you hear it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. They're really good at what they do. I, I, I'm going to be honest. I, uh, I grew up on a, dairy, on a dairy and grain farm. You put it in the ground and it grows. Uh, you, uh, as long as you have some experience at it, it's pretty easy to control. Yes, sir. So the question was my stance on some of these enhanced maturation techniques. Uh, I fundamentally believe that you can't cheat Mother Nature, you can't cheat science. Uh, to each their own, if that works for their marketing, if that works for their product, absolutely go for it. But our philosophy at Kentucky Peerless is let Mother Nature have her time, let her have her temperature. We don't do any thermal cycling, we don't do any... Uh, music, we don't do any rocking or uh, any of the fun different techniques of trying to uh, accelerate the whiskey. And this even extends into the small barrels. Everything we do is a 53 gallon barrel that's actually sourced from right here in Louisville with Kelvin Cooperage. Uh, they, they are a specialty artisan barrel manufacturer. Uh, so much the same way that we focus on making really good whiskey, we entrust that whiskey to a really good barrel in Kelvin Cooperage. And Kelvin's unique in the fact that they don't use any natural gas or infrared heat. They only use actual wood fire, so wood scraps from the barrel making process they use to fuel the fire, the toast, and then chars the barrel. Pretty amazing. You've never seen people work as hard as they do. For sure. Yes, sir. Level three. With a medium toast beneath. It really maximizes the red layer of the char, which is where all your caramels, uh, uh, rich vanillas are going to be coming from. So what they do is they have a very small, consistent fire that's a much milder heat that slowly penetrates into the wood. See, just the oak stave itself does not have a great permeability as far as whiskey getting into it or flavor coming out. Additionally, the flavors that has access to that point haven't reached the form that we find palatable. So that heat activates them. So this medium toast uh, works its way deeper into the wood and activates more of it to create that caramelized sugar effect. Then when we char, we back it off to number three char, which is much shallower, uh, so we don't burn it all away. Yes, sir. How much time between char and vacuum drilling? Generally, uh, the question was how long between char and actually filling the barrel. Uh, generally, this is less than a week or two. It has to be very quick, otherwise the wood will actually dry out, and the barrel will uh, 
kind of fall apart. It's not a good site. Yes, sir. So the question was, how long is too long in the barrel? Uh, obviously, being a young distillery, we don't have this problem yet because everything we do is made on site. Our oldest whiskey is just turning six years old now. But as far as my stance, uh, I haven't reached the point where I'm able to witness it firsthand, but one of my personal idols is Jimmy Russell. Uh, once upon a time, I asked him the same question, and he said, after 11 years, the population begins to start going downhill. Uh, he said, that doesn't mean I don't sell whiskey. It's older than that, but overall, that's where you start to see diminishing returns, where so much of the flavor and characteristics that you work so hard in distilling are beginning to degrade and fall out of the whiskey. Uh, when you get to those exceptionally old ages, it's not just that it's picked up a ton of oak, it's that much of the other flavors are beginning to wean and fall away. The question was, do we plan on getting older? And it's absolutely yes. We just, we haven't been old enough to have old whiskey yet. You'd be surprised when we first started distilling in 2015, we'd have tourists come in in 2016 wanting to know where our eight and 10 year old product was. And it was really hard to explain to them like, no, 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 it, it's not the norm to go out and source whiskey. We make it ourselves and we have to wait. So you plan on 10 years? Absolutely. We're working on it, but the uh, the beauty of the amount of sales and support we're having, uh, we're having to pinch. It, it's fun to sock back uh, just enough whiskey while still allowing us to satisfy our current markets. And Caleb and I have a really exciting, uh, what we call maturation chart, that you have to kind of allocate barrels out to reach those older ages. And we look at this probably once a week to make sure we're preparing for the future. Let's see, four more years. Yep. 2025, because we started in the barrel in uh, March 15. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so uh, to break it apart real quick, the question was the difference between bourbon and whiskey, and if Kentucky really does have the stake on it's not bourbon if it's not from Kentucky. Uh, so bourbon is a subcategory of whiskey. Whiskey is a broad definition for uh, spirits made from grain stored within a barrel. Uh, bourbon is obviously a specialized set of that because it has to be 51% or more, has to be in a new charred white oak barrel, and it has several other definitions that it has to follow. Uh, as far as the, uh, does Kentucky make the best whiskey? I would say yes, as far as bourbon goes. Uh, that's just my personal opinion. There are a lot of really good whiskeys out there. Um, but the element that people typically draw on is Kentucky has the pine wood, Kentucky has the grain, the limestone water. Uh, one resource that's often forgotten about is the people. The, uh, the resources that we have to draw on as far as other distillers, other people who are willing to teach and educate and lend. Uh, if someone calls on the street and they're out of barley, uh, we typically lend it to them. Versa. Uh, just the industry knowledge that's so rich between uh, not only distillers and distilleries, but uh, the support industries, the uh, steel manufacturer, Bindum Copper and Brass Works being right here in town. The amount of resources that we have in the state of Kentucky is why we excel at making whiskey, in my opinion. Okay, we've got a uh, question from Facebook here from Michael Smith. Caleb, Michael asks, when do you know you have the recipe right? How long does it take to know? As uh, Cordell had pointed out when we first started, the running joke at Kentucky Creole says I had four years of job security. So <laughs> when, we, when we started into this, we, I knew where it was tasting, I knew where I thought it was going, but we really had no idea that it was going to turn out as good as it did. I hope so. Uh, my job kind of depended on it. But uh, with something with, like whiskey, you're not able to really call your shot until you get all the way down the line and you're ready to barrel your product. And that's why we waited so long to release our bourbon. Uh, we had people telling us that it was mature at two. We had people telling us it was mature at three. But we wanted to wait until we felt that the bulk of our population was of fearless caliber. Uh, so our, our main focus was waiting until it was a product that we felt upheld the peerless name. 
Caleb, have you mentioned yet that you've never sourced in Peerless's history? Is that oh, thank you for bringing that up. We have never sourced a drop of our whiskey. Everything is made in-house. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Every drop's distilled in-house. Uh, every barrel's tasted by myself, John, and a few other people. And uh, it, it's just a different, more authentic way we feel of making whiskey. So why don't we go to the tasting? And Please do. As, after we do that, we've got a couple of partners and sponsors we're going to introduce. Perfect. So this is now the small batch bourbon. So obviously uh, you're going to see some similarities because we use similar processes. We are going to use that same sour mash. Or I'm sorry, sweet mash, not the uh, sour. We're going to use the low barrel entry proof. We're going to serve everything at barrel strength. Uh, same as before, I want to hear what you all think, so let me hear some nosing. I got some candy over here. Ooh, cotton candy. I love it. It's very floral. It's very fragrant. Ooh, I love pear. Like cooked, though, with like the cinnamon, right? Yep. Like a cinnamon reduction. Yeah. Good deal. Let's move on to the tasting. Any notes we're picking up in terms of the flavor profile? Black cherry, absolutely. Any others? <laughs> What's that? Around 7,000. 7,000 total. And that's about uh, just over 5,000 in Henry County, Kentucky, and 2,000 at our distillery in downtown Louisville. And just to give you an idea, when they're running the still, it isn't, we do 10 to 12 barrels a day. Um, but if, as a distiller, they're coming out every 30 minutes to taste that product. And the key to that is by doing 10 to 12 barrels and coming out every 30 minutes, that is giving themselves the chance to taste at the beginning, middle, and end of each barrel they're making that day. Um, so just kind of give you an idea of how we treat the quality of our product. You know, if, if something's not right or off, we have the ability to go back and change and make adjustments. While also Caleb is recording, every 30 minutes, we're taking down temperatures, um, you know, all, all sorts of things to kind of keep an eye on how we can progress and be better to it, what we're doing. <laughs> it, it depends on the distiller tasting that day, how many, how many ounces. <laughs> Luckily, there's a lot of water breaks built in, a lot of snack time. We have, we have an Uber account for work. So you want to talk about your sponsor, Steve? Yeah, I do. You do? All right. Yeah, thank all you right. for that. We worked on that all last night. All right. So we have a couple of sponsors as you're tasting your small batch bourbon that we'd like to thank. Introduce our first sponsor, 
is the official CPA firm of the Big Bourbon Club, Bluing Company, based out of Indianapolis. They have a huge operation in Louisville, great friends of ours. But they're the official CPA firm, Big Bourbon Club, and they have 16 distiller clients across the country. So in case any distillery in the house is looking for a CPA firm, are there any distilleries in the house? <laughs> All right. Thank you for that, love. Nice plug. Thank you. Um, and we also have uh, the next set of uh, big bourbon club sponsors we'd like to introduce. Justin's House of Bourbon. I know this table has been down there about 15 times. Justin's House of Bourbon. They've been great friends. Wesley's Wicks. Wesley is a young man out of South Florida that makes bourbon candles. He's been a great friend and supporter. And the Whiskey Grail. Have you seen the Whiskey Grail? It's a wooden grail that's made out of white oak. It's actually charred on the, charred on the inside. If you go to BigBourbon.club and go to our merch store, you can order it through there. But he is a sponsor of the Big Bourbon Club. So thanks to the House of Bourbon, Wesley's Wicks, and the Whiskey Grail. So thanks for their support and partnership. Well, Steve, why don't we talk a little bit about how this single barrel selection came to be before we dive into the tasting notes and technical details with John. Perfect. But tell that story. Probably and now we had the surprise it. guest that day. Remember that? Tell the story of the... The selection itself. So, first of all, uh, back on January the 7th, I believe, we were invited to come to Kentucky Peerless Distilling on 10th Street to do a tasting for our barrel pick. And we were told we got to do the double oak, which is absolutely a treat, and as, as I mentioned earlier, and it's, it's rare to have that opportunity. So we thank him again for that. Raise your hand. I know several of you at the table got to taste it with me. So Keith and Todd, any, are you the only two from this group? Yeah, I guess so. But we had uh, Country Bill Bourbon come in from Louisiana. James came in from across the river. But we had 12 people uh, that came in that did the tasting. And we did a private tour. And I'm going to tell you the coolest thing of the private tour, if you don't mind. I'm going to go off script a little bit. It's very unusual for me to do this. But Henry Craver, Henry Craver, right? Yes, sir. Henry Craver is the great-grandfather of Corky Taylor. And we're going to tell that story in a little bit, right? right. Henry Craver, um, who originally owned Peerless, when, what year did he disassemble Peerless in Hendersonville? 1917. Henderson. 1917? Correct. Two years before Prohibition. Two years before Prohibition, Henry Craver, the great-grandfather of Corky Taylor, Sold his company to United Distillers of Canada, I believe, Vancouver, in Vancouver, Canada. And he needed a welder to literally come to Henderson, Kentucky, to disassemble the stills, the equipment, move it up to Canada, reassemble it, and he knew it was going to be about a two-year job. And he hired a gentleman by the name of, who did he hire? Mr. Sherman. Elmore Sherman, my wife's great-grandfather, believe it or not. Now you know the rest of the story. We did not know this. We knew that Suzanne's great-grandfather was the founder of Sherman Brothers. Excuse me, that's your other company. Vendome Copper, excuse me, was the founder of Vendome Copper. Vendome Copper is absolutely the Rolls Royce of all stillmakers in the world today. They have orders all across the world, but that was her great-grandfather. But it was Henry Craver who put him into business. He had never done a still in his life. He disassembled, he took it to Canada took his family up there for two years and moved back, and he had so much skills with stills, he created Vendome Copper, which is now, 80 years later, the greatest manufacturer in the world, right? And still family-owned and operated by the Sherman family. It is still fourth-generation Sherman family-owned and operated. Excuse me a second. <laughs> we didn't know that until we went down to the distillery tour, and there was a huge picture in the still room of Vendome Copper people, and I said to my husband, I said, that looks like my grand... <laughs> I said, that, that looks like my grandfather, but that's not him, but these three are his brothers, I'm almost sure. And sure enough, the man in the three-piece suit, my mother knew as her grandfather, because I took a picture of the old picture and showed it to my mother that afternoon. She said, yes, those are your great uncles, but that is your great-grandfather in the three-piece suit. He always wore a three-piece suit. And she remembers when they left for Canada, and he took his family to Canada because she was just a young girl. So it's just so funny to hear the whole story. So anyway, it was exciting for me. 
Thank you for sharing that. What an amazing story. Thank you for sharing that, my wife. Okay, so we're going to pour, so we picked a double oak, right? And we have That's not right. released it until today. And the only people that tasted the double oak was at the tasting itself when John miraculously found a solution to our problem, and he pulled one out at the last second. And I tell you what, let me ask you a question. Hey, Todd, real quick. What is your thought of the double oak when we taste it on January 7th? Fantastic. This, stuff, this juice is incredible. You're going to love it, so you're going to taste it now. We'll get out and pour it. And while we're pouring it, I'd like to bring up Mr. Sean Higgins. Sean is a, not only a great friend from 100 years ago, but he is a big sponsor of the Big Bourbon Club. He owns Mint Julep Tours and Derby City Cruisers. And Sean's going to speak to you for three minutes, three minutes about. And I don't get a pour. Well, we're going to give you, you a pour. You me up when there's a yeah, pour. Jump in front of the camera. Start the clock. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Uncle Steve. So I'm uh, Sean Higgins. Uh, my wife and I, 14 years ago, uh, started Mint Julep Tours in Louisville. Um, I was in technology and not having much fun. And I had a buddy who's a global brand manager at Maker's Mark at the time, and they were putting a meeting together for the marketing of the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. And he said, well, why don't you sit in on this and see if anything interests you? So they explained what they were doing and how they were going to market it. And I said, well, if somebody calls, who do they call? And they hadn't figured that out yet. But they said, we do have a map. So we're going to send everybody this map. So I think I was the first one to suggest to them they were going to promote drinking and driving throughout the state of Kentucky <laughs> <laughs> and spend $5 million to do it. So I wrapped the bus. And uh, Bill Samuel said it early, and we, we feel the same today, 14 years later. As soon as he saw the bourbon bus that we wrapped and we brought up to his driveway, he said, it's the shoelace. I said, what? He said, think about it. I said, well, yeah, maybe we tie it all together. He said, yeah, but everybody ties their shoelace different. So there's eight distilleries out there right now, and you're going to have to figure out 80 different ways to figure out the tours and experiences you can provide your guests. So now there's 32, and this is one of the most, I tell you, this is an authentic family, built an authentic distillery and has have a true authentic Kentucky bourbon, and it's one of the true success stories of a family in the craft industry and what they're doing to influence the industry. So... This is where innovation is happening. So what we do is we're kind of the concierge service. To, if you can imagine, for those who have made trips here, especially this year and at this time, it's confusing who's open, what restrictions they have, can we get tickets, and then it's a Tetris to put your schedule and itinerary together. So we take that all the way from you. We basically handle 98% of our calls where should I go, what should I do, where should I stay, and where should I eat? So we take care of all that for you. We provide safe transportation throughout the trail. Uh, we've been doing it for 14 years, uh, won a number of awards, and uh, gotten the trust of most of the distillers uh, in bourbon country. And by that, we can offer elevated and exclusive experiences that the general public can't get uh, access to. So I Yes, you go to our website and take a look at some of those elevated and exclusive experiences. Trust us when we say we know what we're doing and we're going to keep you safe. Um, we're going to keep you fed. We're going to keep water in your belly. And we're going to keep your bung up and your bourbon down, hopefully, as they say. So uh, Bourbon City Cruisers was an offshoot. We decided to take on the urban bourbon nature of uh, the distilling experience, and we got... Tuk-tuks are the most common uh, transportation vehicle in the world. Here you go. This is a peerless pass for two. It's free. Dinner. It's a $40 value. $40 value for free by being a guest tonight of Peerless. So take that home. You must present it to get it. So thank you, Peerless, for that. We appreciate it. Our pleasure. Thank you all. Very much appreciate it. Okay, Caleb. Take it away. We have, I believe, one more Facebook question. Oh, my goodness, it keeps scrolling. How do you unscroll an Apple computer when you're 58 years old? 
Okay, Quentin, scroll that thing back for me. All right, so we're going to jump into the double oak, our barrel pick. Well, I was going to say, I think that you should tell us a little bit about how that selection went, and then, I mean, who better than you all to tell the notes on it? Well, I, I Todd, Keith, you, you want to you sh share the story? We had three. Go ahead, Todd. Come on. When, when this all went down, um, now I'm not going up front. <laughs> me, me and Keith. Um, uh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> when when this all came to be, it happened very quickly. Um, the, the the crew was picked. Um, we got to come down. The experience was to these guys was so special. Um, they brought us in. Um, Corky talked to us, did the whole history, um, told us everything about Peerless and how it came to be, and then they took us upstairs. Now, when I say take us upstairs, we go up these long st stairs, go up into this room, and the table they set us down at is to die for if you're a bourbon drinker. Um, pot still, legs. Um, they sit us down, and then they give us four samples. They give us a small batch. They give us three, three single barrels to try. We sit down, we, we do, do this whole thing, um, let me go. <laughs> let me, there, there's something kind of special and, and funny to this. We're all, before we all went upstairs, we're, all of us are sitting together. There's, what, 10 of us, Keith? Some, eight, eight, 10 of us. Um, supposed to be 12. Couple comes in. Um, look pretty local. Not really the club, if I would, if, to be polite. Um, bring them in and introduce them, husband and wife. We all go upstairs. This kind of, they didn't quite fit. <laughs> Just to say, to be polite. As we go through the tasting, we do our small batch, get our, get our base, do our single barrels. We talk through each one of them and we really are like, breaking it down, seeing what we really like. Um, Cordell leaves. We're like, Where, where'd Cordell go? But okay. We kind of pick it. During the pick, this one couple, we keep asking about tasting notes. What do you think about it? And he keeps saying, Well, I'm really not a bourbon drinker. I'm not really, I don't, I don't like, I'm more a tequila. I'm not, we're like, what, what are you doing? Find out they were just there for a tasting, not a barrel pick. They're not even in the club. What did they say when I asked them if they like whiskey? They didn't like it. They said, I don't like it. I don't like it. I said, do you even like barbecue? No. So, what are you doing here? It was the first and only time we've ever had someone crash a single so barrel selection. <laughs> they just let themselves right in and yes. joined in with the group. And oh, yeah. We, we took them in like, hey, we're, we're here for you. We're glad to meet you. No, they didn't, they didn't like the bourbon. So You know, it's funny, too, because they didn't wait. They waited until the last five minutes to excuse themselves, too. Yeah. You know, it wasn't and they, like And they did it the gracefully. Beginning. They were like, well, we just really got to go. We, we got some place to be. And we're like, <laughs> then we're all looking at each other like, what just happened? <laughs> but but let us, as us, as the original actual bourbon club members, let me just say the, the three they gave us were outstanding. The one we thought we were going to pick was phenomenal. And then when Cordell comes back and says, hey, Caleb's got this other one that we want you to try. And then we're like, what's up? <laughs> what's up with this? And let me just say, as much as we enjoyed the one that we thought we were going to pick, this one blew that one away. And this, this is something special. This is a unicorn. This is something that I think everyone's going to cherish, and I can't wait for you to try it. Cheers. All right. Cheers. Thank you. Actually, what Todd didn't say is the couple, I'm not going to describe how they looked. It was kind of tough. It was kind of rough, right? But 
he finally said when they got up and left, he goes, this is actually my first date with her, and i got to drive her back to Laurel County. <laughs> I can't make it up. I'm just, I'm just telling you what happened. And I, <laughs> so let me, let me just say one more thing. So you're now trying. You're getting ready. To, Caleb's going to take over. You're now trying the double oak. And only for this occasion, I brought in a, uh, a special effect. Hey, hey, Russell and Rhonda, stand up. Russell and Rhonda, stand up now. So this is Russell and Rhonda Oaks. We have a double oak in the audience, and we got a double oak at the table. You're my favorite oak right there, bro. All right, Caleb, it's yours. Well, should we have the Oaks give their tasting notes? Come on up here. Come on, <laughs> Come on, Come on up. Come on up here, Alabama. Come on up, Mobile. The, the Double Oaks are going to give you their Double Oak review. Woo! Russell, get in front of the camera. There is no wrong answer to this, by the way. Please stand in front of him. <laughs> well, guys, you get oak. Great answer. <laughs> Lots of florals. You are moving to the taste? This is so smooth. It's incredibly smooth. It doesn't drink like it's, what, a hundred and some? 109.9. Dark, dark maple. maple. I get like some toasted uh, citrus to it. Kind of brulee sugar. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Even though it is a double oak and it has went through that second maturation within the barrel. It's toasted still, marshmallow. I like that. Ooh, toasted. I love that. Yep. Even though it has a ton of oak, it's not drowning out the other notes. There's still a lot of citrus. There's still a lot of sugar. It's not overpowering. Right. Good point. He said the oak's not overpowering. You'll notice a lot of double oaks are overly oaked. Right. Still a great mouthfeel, not too astringent, really pleasant. Yep. Well, thank you. <laughs> Ask him. That'll be next year. Thank you all to the Oaks, everybody. Cheers to the Oaks. <laughs> so uh, we've got another question from Facebook. Cordell, how often can we find Double Oak in the retail world, and in what states would you distribute that in? I wish. We need, we need to talk to your state a little bit more. There's some things there we can work on. We'll have a longer conversation after. Um, but no, in terms of double oak, it is extremely rare. So for example, right now, we're only doing about five single barrels of double oak for the entire United States in one year. It is not a regular skew. This is a special offering, the first of which this year was with the Big Bourbon Club. So very rare. Pour it out. Yeah. Ma'am. As far as the uh, just the, the front and back label. label? Are you talking about the the side label? Correct. So with each of these labels, we have an in-house graphic designer, Katie, and we send her inspiration for every label. So if that's the big Bourbon Club logo, they're hand applied. Yeah. Hand applied. Yeah. There you go. It's like a bet that was won. Was that, was that and I told you so? Oh, wow. Hand applied. Any more questions? Keep them coming, please. I've got, a, I've got a Facebook question. Can I ask that? Sure. Uh, yeah. Ladies first. 
Miss Hamilton. Miss Hamilton. She asked about the design inspiration for the bottle. It's, it's modeled after what we call our pot doubler. We double distill our product. The first pass through is the column still and then through the pot doubler. So that onion dome shape on top of the pot doubler is the top of the bottle. You can see the rivet detail along the shoulder of the bottle, just below the neck of the bottle. Yep, good question. Thank you, Amy. You're the greatest, don't ever change. <laughs> Okay, Caleb, we have a question from, hey, Chris Randall, we got a question from Bob Wright. Where's Bob from? Boston Bob. Big Boston Bob Wright says, Caleb, is there a set age to pull one barrel before you put it into another for a double oak? So the sourcing of their double oak products is pretty simple. We do not intentionally double oak product. We haven't yet. Uh, released a single double oak that was intentionally put into that secondary barrel. Instead, what happens is we come across barrels within a rickhouse that barrels come from organic matter. I mean, trees are imperfect, and as such, certain barrels become imperfect. So when you go and you find a stave that has a crack, uh, when you have a split, when you have a knot hole, something that isn't something that we can fix with a small wooden peg, what we do is to rescue that whiskey, we pour it into a new barrel. So as such, it gets an extra draw of the caramel, the oak, the, uh, the fattiness, the beautiful notes that it gets from that barrel times two. Uh, so uh, there isn't a set amount. Some barrels are double oaked if we notice a leak at six months. Other ones are double oaked at four years if we discover the leak. Just call it double oak, exactly. It's a so happy accident. We've got another question for Mr. John Waydell, John. So when we, <laughs> John, when we uh, when we did our double oak tasting, we went through three, and we actually spent a lot of time, right? We did. And and we were thoughtful about it, and we picked one, and, and Keith talked to this process, but literally you left the room for 25 minutes and came back, and you found another double oak you want us to try, which is what we got. Well, Tell us the story of that. Well, to kind of dive into a little bit of our process, you know. When it comes to single barrel selection, we don't just wait till the day of, roll some barrels out for groups and say, here you go, try these barrels. Um, you know, we take several days leading up to the selection to go through samples, myself, Caleb, um, Nick, one of our other distillers, and you know, we hand pick these samples out of here and it's a couple days worth of tasting going through them. And then the day of, we're sitting in the tasting room, my phone is going off my pocket, but you know, I'm not rude, so I'm like, I'm not gonna check it, I'm dealing with the group, and then finally I'm like, I gotta see what this is, and it's Caleb. And he said, hey, I'm down here tasting. I know we're tasting double oak. Uh, can you come down here for a second? Have they picked the barrel yet? I'm like, well, I think they got a decision on which one. But I was like, give me one second. I'll be down there. And when you have a master distiller buzzing in on you saying, hey, they need to, you need to come down here and taste this barrel and take it up there. You know, I'm like sprinting down there like, I got to go down there. I got to get down there. <laughs> so he's like, try this. We taste and he's like, take this up there. I'm like, it's got to go up there. So I think I came back up to the room. I was like, listen, I know you all are heart set on this barrel right now, but Caleb said you all have to try this one. And so lo and behold, we take it up there, and I think it was an easy decision on which barrel we were going to take. But that also kind of goes in about the double oak. We don't have a set flavor profile we look for in these double oaks. If we taste it and we believe that it is good enough to go into the selection, we put it out there. But just kind of give you an idea of how, the, how that works. Yeah. A master distiller is sitting there texting saying, hey, I think this group's going to like this barrel. So that's a big well, you, thing for me. It worked out perfectly for us, so thank you. John, how many single barrels do you procure a year? Um, we do 100 barrels a year to kind of give you how, how selective we are on how many barrels we put out in the market. So we do 50 rye and 50 bourbon a year, and that is it for the market. So, But, I mean, I could probably get to taste through hundreds of barrels hundreds of barrels a year, uh, thanks to this guy right here. So do you have a waiting list for single barrel selects and picks? Cordell, what is that, like a year out? Two About years a year out? and a half out right now. Could you be influenced if a lot of people stood up and cheered real loud that we want another one? <laughs> really? Come on! Come on! That was really, really weak. If I were John, I wouldn't do it. 
A little bit louder. There's only been one ever. Facebook question. Tell us about the Triple Oak. Oh, I don't believe that that had enough time to go through the... <laughs> I was think that, that, that was just you. Was that a Steve question? That was a Steve question. Yeah, the, the Triple Oak was a really, uh, depending on how you look at it, really lucky or really unlucky barrel worth of whiskey because we put in a great barrel that wasn't a great barrel, fell apart in a little in short order, so we put it in another barrel, and then that one fell apart, so we get it into a third. And that's where it spent the duration of its uh, maturation. So it spent one barrel one year, second barrel one year, the last barrel two years. So it was really gummy, really sweet. It was uh, it looked like motor oil by the time it was done, but it was delicious. So, Caleb, we've got a comment on Four Facebook. Years. They said that your Hollywood double is Josh Turner. I'll take that. Huh? I'll take it. I just made that up. Okay. Oh, man, come on. I was going to take that home to the wife. You look like Josh Turner, and you got a good, deep voice. We're going to have fun with that at the distillery. Exactly. <laughs> Never going away. Okay, so we actually have another question from Facebook Live. Uh, are you planning on doing a double-double oak? Is that a quadruple oak? Or is it to the, like, to the second power? Or like, how are we doing this? It's called squared. Squared. <laughs> yeah, to the second power. Okay, uh, no, uh, no intentions on a quadruple oak. Uh, I will say that we are starting to warm up to the idea of going ahead and double oaking a few barrels uh, intentionally. We're going to start looking at that, but uh, in the meantime, no, no sight set on triple oak. Would you consider a local bourbon club, a new bourbon club with 2,700 members to be the first one to do the barrel pick of the double, double oak? Let me ask, is this, uh, is this Facebook asking again? Time will tell, Steve. Time will tell. We'll see. <laughs> All right, I'm not, I'm not sure to growl, but we've got a question out here. The question is, do we ever drink any other bourbons? And it, yes, uh, variety is the spice of life. Uh, I think myself and John kind of fall into a special category where we want to go out and we want to see everyone else's single barrel picks to really pick apart, dissect, and see uh, not only what the distillery is putting forth and into the market, but what people actually like. Uh, one of my favorite stories with this is we were actually doing market work out in San Francisco, and an amazing place out there, Hardwater, uh, one of the whiskey icons of the West Coast. Uh, I go in there, and I'm trying to sell them on product, but it, I talk less about Peerless and more, well, what, what's that pick? T tell me what you like. And so I was able to go through several of his selections and see that he had a very particular note that he loved across several different brands. Fast forward six months, he's coming into the distillery to do his own single barrel selection, and I, I make sure that we stack the deck and we have that note in every one of the ones he's trying. And he looks at me, he's like, you remembered, you got me. But yes, uh, we love trying other people's whiskey. It, 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 it's, a, it's a great way of learning. Uh, if we only tried our own whiskey, we wouldn't be concerned with learning and growing as a distillery. And I never want that to be the case. What is my favorite non-peerless? Uh, for me, nah, for me, it, it, I, I'm, I'm a Russell's guy. I, I, I love uh, Jimmy Russell. I mean, it, whether, he's the hero. He's my hero. Uh, regardless of what's in the bottle, it's just what the man has built and who he is and the character he has. Uh, yeah, I, 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 it's nostalgic, but I'll say that. Uh, for me, it's definitely wild turkey all the way. Uh, I probably have about six old dusties at home. I just I love their juice. They've been doing it for such a long time, and I grew up drinking wild turkey before I was of age. You know, so, so I mean that, that's just my go-to. No, and for me, I like to really experiment with a lot of different barrel strength products because I like to compare our low barrel entry proof from these gentlemen right here, and how that compares to others out there. So one in particular that I enjoy is Elijah Craig barrel proof. Um, whiskey of the year a few years back. My dad and I used to go down to the Evan Williams Experience on Main Street and buy it for 50 bucks a bottle. Uh, I think the limit was maybe six bottles each, and we'd buy six bottles each. Um, that's still one of my all-time favorites. You can't beat the complexity of that product. So we've got a comment, or it's actually a question on Facebook. Um, Karen from San Francisco asks, she says that she loves romantic novels and long walks on the beach. Are any of you single? Woo! 
to inbox me. <laughs> she was asking about Caleb. Oh, uh -huh. I'm just joking. I'm joking. Hannah okay. will kill you. I made that up too. So here's a real question. Would you ever do a double oak rye, Mike Smith? Yeah, we, we, we do have. it all the time. Do you do it now? Is it for, can you find it? Uh, it's, oh, we actually do have one in the gift shop right now, yeah. All right, so if you're going to the Peerless Gift Shop with your free passport, go get a double oak rye. So, Michael Smith, thank you for that. Great question. Okay, where are we now? I think we lost control here. We finished up the tasting. Have we finished up our double oak yet? Have you drank it? Yeah. It, <laughs> and just real quick, I want to touch base on the two small batches we taste, um, just to give an idea of how much, you know, dedication and just time goes into that. He's only choosing 20 to 25 barrels to go into these small batches. I mean, at that point, you're not masking flavor. You're really trying to bring it together and make it work. Um, so, you know, not to beef him up here, but yeah, hats off to him, and uh, he does a great job. Nice job. Thank you. And another note real quick on the small batch bourbon we didn't mention. It was named the top Kentucky bourbon in 2020. Woo! Yeah. That's the small batch bourbon. I believe a question yeah, is by you? the pretty lady in the front row. I know you're a young man for the distiller, but what is your background and how Okay, so uh, the question was, what, what are my origins? And uh, the, the, uh, the very first thing, no, I've not been drinking since I was four. Actually, no, no, I honestly haven't. I, see, I grew up on a dairy farm, so I grew up around sanitary process, mechanical systems, and hardworking people. And I, I grew up in a household without alcohol. I, I, I did not see intoxication. A household. I'm not going to repeat what she said. <laughs> Okay. Okay, a household without alcohol. Uh, there, there was no time for drinking on a dairy farm because you're milking twice a day, every day of the year. They don't care if it's Christmas, if it's snowed, or who's, uh, who's sick. So uh, it was a great, yeah, it was a great way to grow up. Uh, but as far as my entry into the distilling world, I became fascinated while I was in college. And not the way most people get fascinated with alcohol. I fell in love with the science of it. At this point, I was still not a drinker. I was very much a geek. I was a nerd. I was really good with chemistry. And uh, with my agricultural background, I spoke the same language uh, as the different people who were engineers within the industry, the distillers, the cookers, the people who actually did the work. So I started going out and taking distillery tours. I was able to work my way into a few different apprenticeships and job shouting opportunities under these industry veterans, these people who've held up these massive brands and uh, been the problem solvers for these giants for years and years and years who've honestly worked their way into uh, consulting positions in their retirement. Uh, they were blessings in my life. They took me under their wing. And uh, one of the people was actually re distantly related to you, Rob Sherman, president of Vendome Copper and Brass. Uh, the president of Vendome Copper and Brass took me under his wing and made sure they had shadowing opportunities and uh, chances to go out and learn from these other distillers, from these other distilleries. And it's really all that foundational knowledge from studying all these different distillers and all these different cookers that really aided me in Peerless. So when I first started with Peerless, my expectation was to come in. Uh, it was a summer job between uh, semesters. I had one uh, more semester, six months done. I wanted to go out and I wanted to learn and see a distillery function. Well, my mentor said, don't see one function, see one be built. So they pointed me to Carson and Corky, the family ownership of Kentucky Peerless, and I met him in the mud and the gravel of the building and agreed to come on board for $12.50 an hour to saw and stack lumber and move gravel and block and whatever needed to be done. Um, but luckily, no one on site had any idea how stills needed to go together or uh, they didn't have the mechanical background that I had. They didn't have the scientific background I had. And so uh, I was just gung-ho enough and apparently a decent uh, smooth talker to get them believing that a 22-year-old knew that a distillery, uh, how it needed to be put together. And I kind of became the local liaison who started out with baby steps as far as managing a mechanical contractor, managing uh, 
basic things with the way the equipment was designed. Uh, but before it was over, I was laying out the process piping and even uh, laying out the control schematic for how the computer triggered this valve to that cue, to the, the run at this volume, to really the nuts and bolts of what makes the distillery work. I was uh, heavily involved in not only laying out how it works, but actually programming it into the central computer as well. Uh, by the time I was leaving to go back for my last semester of school, Carson Corky had already approached me about becoming their distiller. Uh, I was bouncing that last semester of school, going and managing construction on Fridays and the weekends to fly by wire the other four days of the week. Uh, but it was an unbelievable opportunity that I was blessed with. I had amazing people and amazing support structure. And uh, every now and then God just lays things out for you. And I, I was blessed enough to have some amazing people for an amazing journey. Uh, Carson and Corky uh, had tons of faith in me. I mean, you, as uh, when people say four years of job security, usually it's with someone who has some track record. Uh, I just had uh, apparently enough charisma to convince them. But, and I was right out of college. I wasn't done with college. Yeah. And there's a great article that actually captures that story in Bourbon Plus Magazine, and it's the cover article about him called The Young Master. So if you get a chance, read that. It's a fantastic article. But the short form answer is I, I'm very blessed. <laughs> Caleb, great story. Thank you for that. We appreciate it very much. Um, any other questions before we go to our, yes, sir. Who's that, Sean? I haven't noticed any aging differences yet because most of the stuff of that Henry County Rickhouse uh, won't be coming to maturity. Uh, see, it's still 19, so it'll be 2022 before we really start looking into that. Uh, I expect it to be similar in that they're both single-story rickhouses. I would expect the airflow to probably be a little better out there. So if anything, I'd expect it to be better than our efforts so far. So I, I view diversity as uh, quite an advantage because especially when we're looking at single barrels, it would be so boring if every single barrel tasted the same. And that's why it's so special when we come across barrels that are capable of being a single barrel that stand unique against the small batch. And that's where the double oaks in particular are so special because we don't say, ooh, this one's in a second container. It can be a single barrel. It has to pass all the same stringency uh, to be a single barrel as any other barrel. So we've turned down a whole lot more than the ones we've actually promoted into the program. Yes, sir. I'm sure someone is doing it, but we have not. So the, uh, the question was, what happens to the barrels that we don't deem to be capable of being a single barrel on the front end? That are, they are in that second container. They are eligible to be double oak, but we just turn them down. They go back on the rick and they continue maturing. Uh, most of, I was talking about the grading process as we go through. When we turn down a barrel, almost always the reason is it needs more time. It hasn't reached the point where it needs to be. It's a, it's, a, it's a late bloomer. It takes a little longer to mature. So we have another comment from Facebook Live from Mary Kate. Mary Kate says, John, I don't care how tall you are, but if you're more than nine foot tall standing on your wallet, I will DM you tonight. <laughs> my wallet out or well that's between you and Mary Kate <laughs> I feel like that might be a relative of keep mine. your keep, <laughs> keep your wallet in your pocket okay so we're closing up here uh, before we officially close we want to thank some partners of the big bourbon club uh, we have several partners that you know of and maybe some of you don't bourbon women club uh, from Peggy Stevens here in Louisville a kid that I went to grade school with we're great friends she started the first women's bourbon club over a decade ago with over 10,000 members. The Whiskey Army, Kentucky Bourbon Trail, through the Fraser Museum is the official stop. Liquor Barn, Tag Your Swag, which is our merch store. And last but not least, hey, Kyle, pop out here, man. You're not doing anything. Get out of here. So Kyle from Lone Wolf Productions, Silent Wolf Productions, Kyle has put this on live. Thank you, brother. Okay. Thanks.
great partners, great supporters, and great friends of ours. Um, what's next? So the first Tuesday of May, we're going to have Horse Soldier. Horse Soldier, um, Scott Neal is their COO, soon to become the CEO, will fly from Tampa, and he'll present to you uh, the story of Horse Soldier. If you don't know it, go read about it. It's absolutely fascinating. Uh, they're a true American heroes. What they did two weeks after 9-11 when the president... President Bush sent them into Afghanistan to chase Osama bin Laden out, and they had the Taliban surrender in two months. And they also have a great, great whiskey, and they're coming up in a month. So don't miss that. We have barrel picks from Woodford Reserve and Knob Creek. We've actually done those picks in terms of tasting, and we'll release those here in the next couple of months. And then our summer schedule starts. So in June, New Riff will come in to present. And that starts the weekend schedule. So most of you out-of-towners, if it's easier, you can come in on the weekend. So those are Saturday afternoon presentation and tastings. Um, any final words from the Peerless team? And thank you so, so much, not just for coming tonight, but for all you've done, Cordell, and helping with Corky into making this thing a reality for us. Well, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you all so much. We couldn't do this without you all. This is what keeps us passionate every day. These kind of engagements, these kind of questions, the passion you guys show uh, on the app. I think it was 30 days. Uh, people were asking me questions, phenomenal questions. Some of the most intricate questions I've received are from people that are members of this group. That's greatly appreciated. And keep those coming. And please come visit us anytime you can. Anytime you're out and about, ask for Peerless, and we'll try to make it happen at that account. So can't thank you enough. Thank you, Cordell. Um, let me ask, hey. Alex, Chris, stand up. No woot woots. You don't even know who they are yet. Chris Randall, the young guy with the gray beard and the blue shirt, just flew in from Dallas this morning. Alex drove in from Little Rock. These two guys co-chair the big bourbon club committee. How many members are on our committee now? 28, 30 members. People that we've never met in person, unless they've come to this event, get together every other week and work on things that make Big Bourbon Club great. So, Chris, Alex, thank you so much for what you're doing to help us. We appreciate it. That's the end of the, uh, the official um, Peerless presentation and tasting. Caleb, thank you so much. Hey, thank you, and seriously, it our dreams are not possible without you all coming out. So, uh, seriously, you all make the world go round. Thank you all so much for uh, coming out and talking to us. John, thank you for coming out. We really appreciate it. Thank you all for having me. Um, one thing I'd like, for anybody that's here, I'd like to purchase a bottle and get everyone here to sign the bottle. By the way, if we could, I mean, just... If you worries. want your bottle signed, come on up now and meet the Peerless team, and they'd be more than happy to sign it, Okay. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank we you. appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.